If you thought bar rescue was just about revamping dilapidated bars, think again. Today, we're diving deep into the chaos that erupts when John Taffer decides it's time to lay down the law. Fans of bar rescue know that sometimes tensions boil over, and things get, let's say, a bit hands-on. From shoving matches to full-blown brawls, we're counting down the most jaw-dropping moments when bar rescue got physical. Brace yourselves. These are going to be the most explosive, physical confrontations ever seen on Bar Rescue. Buckle up, it's going to be a wild ride. The first episode is from Season 4, which is fittingly titled Thugs with Mugs. In it, we're taking a trip to Yonkers, New York, a stone's throw away from Manhattan, to visit the undisputed sports bar and grill. It is run by Miguel Torres and Brian O'Shea, former boxers who hung up their gloves to open a bar in 2009. Things initially went well, but then standards and security began to drop over time. These guys found themselves in a tight spot, losing money hand over fist as patrons left for safer bars. Before Taffer and his crew arrive, we see that the bar was full of drama and fighting nonstop. And in fact, according to Brian, the bar only has one type of clientele. Okay, the hood is our only crowd. Hoodlums, eh? That's great. Drowning in a staggering $120,000 of debt and hemorrhaging thousands more each month, they're racing against the clock with just weeks left before the final knockout punch. Rolling up is John Taffer and his rescue team. Before heading into the bar himself, Taffer sends in a reconnaissance team, Ray, Brian, and Matt, while he and his crew watch what's happening from a screen out in the parking lot. Their findings? undercooked wings, and loads of other hygiene issues in the kitchen. However, what's worse is that Brian gets hammered in the bar and acts like a buffoon, while Miguel works hard taking orders. Brian seems like an owner who is less concerned with business and more into the booze. That's a red card in any game, my friends. Don't touch your own stash, right? As the night goes on, Brian just stands there, beer in hand, leering like a total drunk creep at the guests inside the bar. No employees or customers want to be around Brian, especially Miguel, who is really trying to at least run a proper establishment. Right when the owners begin to argue, John decides it's time to swoop in. If there ever was a cue, that was it. Ain't anybody be a bigger asshole than you. Yikes, and Taffer has been to what, 800 plus bars? If he is telling you that, it must be serious. Next comes Russell, who, after doing a bit of sleuthing of his own, discovers the bar's dirty secret. They're passing off cheap liquor as the good stuff. That alone is enough to get their liquor license taken away and their bar shut down. John is not amused. In fact, he tells them right to their faces that they are thieves. You're a thief, and I say the same to you. After that, Taffer decides to take a timeout, literally walking out of the bar. And just like that, Miguel and Brian have to shut down for the night. However, this is when things start to get nasty. Word gets out amongst the customers that the bar was swapping cheap booze for more expensive stuff, and this makes the customers inside a little bit rowdy. A fight, or a series of fights, break out inside the bar. Tensions rise, and they are forced to call the cops. What happens next is unclear. It seems that in the middle of the chaos, one of the angry customers and a camera guy may have bumped into each other, which set off a fight. Outside the bar, we then see a scuffle take place involving the bar rescue camera crew and several of the bar customers. This is crazy. I've never seen a bar rescue episode like this before. We even see one of the crew members fleeing for their lives. The scuffle continues outside and eventually the police arrive. It was so bad that the next day, the entire bar rescue team had to have a meeting with members who did not feel comfortable being at the bar without protection. Taffer and his crew return to the bar the next day after the fighting, albeit this time with improved security measures in place. Taffer remodels and rebrands the bar as Soyo Craft Bar, which is short for South Yonkers. The new design and concept was targeted towards a new clientele, the after-work crowd for those who live in Yonkers but work in Manhattan. According to Taffer, the outside of the bar is strategically designed. The bright yellow color scheme acts as a thug repellent, as Taffer says, thugs don't come to bars with bright colors that are brightly lit in front. The inside of the place looks great as well, and the staff and owners really seem to like it. The redesign comes with an upgraded draft beer system, 
In fact, Taffer said he sunk $90,000 just into proper refrigeration for the place. Both Miguel and Brian are optimistic about the future. They relaunch to a slightly different crowd by the looks of the people in the line out front. The message from Taffer is clear. Security is a top priority for Soyo, which totally makes sense. We see Taffer confirming with the head of security that the bar has a new dress code that is working great. The episode ends with a follow-up six weeks later, where both Brian and Miguel say that Soyo is the hottest place in town. They really seem to be doing well and both look happy. However, it appears that the bar rescue post-show boost faded rather fast. In an interview with a local newspaper, Miguel said, A month later, the sales went down incredibly, more than 60%, and that if they had continued with Taffer's suggestions, there would be no way they could stay open. Miguel also disagreed with Taffer's concept of targeting a happy hour for young professional Manhattan office workers. Those coming home after work would have preferred to go out around their work for food and drinks, and then after that, they're going to come home to Yonkers, he reckoned. Looking through reviews of the place from Yelp and Google, it appears the standard started to drop not long after the show aired. Reviewers mentioned bartenders who couldn't make the cocktails, playing music too loud, and loads of violent incidents. How many? There was an incredible 65 visits from police to the bar between July 2015 and April 2016. During that period, there were 17 arrests, six of them felonies, including multiple shootings and stabbings out front. With all those issues, it is unsurprising that the bar finally closed in 2018. The fact that it lasted for almost four years after the show is actually a bit of a surprise. They had it listed for sale in 2016 for 150 grand, and that was with the $90,000 of refrigeration Taffer and his team had put in. It looks like no one wanted to buy it, as it took several years for it to be acquired. The place is occupied today by an El Salvadorian restaurant. But if you think that was crazy, wait till you see the next one. From thugs with mugs, we move on to Punch Drunk and Trailer Trashed. Located in Council Bluffs, Iowa, the O-Face Bar was once the dream project of married couple Karen and Matthew Overmeyer. After using their retirement funds to launch the bar in 2011, the place initially saw success, but eventually tanked due to terrible management. Now $250,000 in debt, they're desperate for John Taffer and his bar rescue team, including mixologist Russell Davis, to intervene. The bar's exterior is an eyesore, even by Taffer's seasoned standards. O-Face Bar wasn't your typical brick-and-mortar establishment. It was actually constructed from two stationary trailers joined together to create a single bar space. This double-trailer, trailer park-themed bar set the stage for one of the most notorious episodes in bar rescue history. Some have even compared this episode to the infamous Amy's Baking Company episode of Kitchen Nightmares in its notoriety. After sending locals undercover to test the waters, it's clear the issues run deep. The drinks taste pre-made and are served in washed, disposable plastic cups. Ugh, gross. The owners and their buddies drink for free, and at one point, a customer is even seen serving themselves. The chaos unfolds rapidly. The owner's wife, aptly named Karen, rings a bell for drinks, but contributes nothing to the operation. <laughs> then there is the bar manager, Amanda, who we will come back to in a minute. There was some hope in this bar, though. The bouncer, Brian, who prefers to go by the name of Sick, genuinely wants to see the bar succeed, and Sarissa, a waitress who, despite her flaws, at least attempts to do her job. As the night goes on, the staff do shot after shot together, getting more and more drunk. Sick tries his best to keep everyone in line, but in this bar, that is a major challenge. A customer is interested in the orgasm shot. However, she wants to know what the ingredients are first. She asks Sarissa, her waitress. However, she explains that the owners do not tell her how it is made, so she has to go over to Matt to ask him directly. I'm not gonna tell you what's in it. It's our signature yeah, shot. The customer then says if she doesn't know what is in it, then she won't drink it in which Matt rudely says back to her, then don't take it, I'm not gonna tell you. Which absolutely shocks Taffer, who watches on screen in his car. Sarissa stands up for the customer and attempts to remind Matt of this fact, of which he rudely dismisses her. The two continue to quarrel back and forth about the customer service. The customer tries justifying their actions by simply stating that they want to know what was in the shot, which causes Sarissa to shoot back that she doesn't know either, somewhat angrily. 
Well, this really sets off Amanda, who goes ballistic, grabbing Sarissa by the collar, almost like how a schoolyard bully would to an unsuspecting victim on the playground. Amanda pushes Sarissa back, and things get even more heated. Amanda even takes a quick swipe at Matt, hitting him lightly across the face. She really just hit me in the face. Continues, Sarissa calls Matt a little bitch, who just shrugs it off and has a smoke. Meanwhile, Sarissa decides to step outside to cool off. However, Amanda decides to hunt her down, pursuing her outside. They exchange words briefly, and then Amanda starts pushing Sarissa. Amanda gets her into headlock and takes her to the ground. Now, I actually think Amanda being way too drunk probably saved Sarissa, as it caused her to tumble over and both of them to roll around on the ground. Had Amanda been less drunk, she might have done a lot more damage. This is enough, though, requiring John and Russell to intervene. As Taffer arrives, Amanda pushes Sarissa back, who takes a pretty nasty fall, although it could have been far worse had she smacked her head off the concrete. After screaming at both Karen and Matt, John Taffer gives them an ultimatum. They either fire Amanda, or he leaves and doesn't come back to rescue the bar. Sick tries sticking up for Sarissa to Matt, saying that Amanda has been the problem since day one. What a great guy this Sick is. Incredibly though, rather than firing Amanda, they decide to fire Sarissa instead. To top it off, Karen even blames Sarissa for the fight, saying that she, quote, asked for it all the time. Sarissa, you and I asked for it all the time. I asked for that. Wow, so firing someone who got physically attacked and then blaming them as a victim for what happened. Jeez, I can see why this was such an infamous episode. Eventually, however, they do fire Amanda. Or actually, she quits and leaves as she knows what was coming to her. She gets in her pickup truck and drives off. The last we see of her. Or so we think. Nevertheless, the criminality related to this bar just gets worse and worse. Taffer investigates and he finds numerous police criminal reports about offenses at O-Face Bar in the past. Furthermore, Taffer unearths another video, this time showing Matt slapping one of his bartenders. Could his slap in the face from Amanda from before be karma for what he did? Hmm. At this point, John has had enough. He does something that he had never done before up until that point. He walked out of a bar without rescuing it. Taffer feels bad for Sarissa and sick, who gets verbally abused by Matt at the end of the episode for continuing to talk to the cameras. Three months after the show, it is revealed that Matt, Karen, and the staff continue to drink at the bar. Sick was fired. Amanda was rehired as manager, but it keeps getting even crazier. As a consequence of its bar rescue episode, O-Face Bar found itself stripped of its liquor license in 2014. The Council Bluff City Council rejected the license renewal in a narrow 3-2 decision. The trio of councillor members who voted against the bar's renewal openly cited the bar's disastrous appearance on the show as a key factor in their judgment. Adding to the venue's woes, the mayor chimed in, revealing that he had been inundated with emails from all across the nation, all labeling O-Face Bar a blight on the reputation of Council Bluffs. Eventually, Matt was able to get the liquor license reinstated somehow. Believe it or not, as of today, O-Face Bar is still open. Google reviews are not positive, with a 1.5 rating out of 5 stars. To this day, almost 10 years after the episode, they are still getting bombarded with bad reviews from viewers of the show. There was even a shooting inside the bar in 2021. I mean, at least Amanda and Sarissa duked it out outside in the parking lot. One interesting point on their website, it says that O-Face is run solely by Karen Overmeyer. What happened to Matt? If you thought all the above just mentioned was bad enough, wait until you hear this. Matt was arrested for sexual assault charges resulting from an incident involving a woman in February of 2016. He was sentenced to 90 days in jail, along with two years of probation. As part of the plea agreement, Matt was required to register as a sex offender for life. Well, it turns out he didn't register as a sex offender as required, and was subsequently sent back to jail for a second time as a result. How about the rest of the crew from the episode, where are they today? According to Sarissa's Facebook page, she's in a happy relationship with a great family of her own. She runs a business called Pro Market Connections with her partner, Tim. Overall, she looks like she's doing pretty well. Amanda has an active Facebook page that is public. Ironically, she has a post on it that says, you are only as pretty as you treat people. As for Sick, I couldn't find too much information on him. 
John Taffer did post on Twitter that Brian slash Sick is a very good guy and hoped that he was doing well. According to some posts on Reddit, Sick opened his own bar, but I couldn't find any information on it. Wherever Sick is, I hope he is doing well. He seemed like a great guy. But let's end on a good note, shall we? We go to Denver, Colorado for Zanzibar, a billiards bar that had it all. A hot location with 10 pool tables and 8 beers on tap. What could possibly go wrong? Let's dive into this roller coaster of an episode, shall we? So, the story starts with Ami Benari, a former Israeli military man who opened the bar in 2009, which at first was very successful. Then tragedy struck for Ami in 2011, as he had a life-altering accident that took him away from the bar. You'd think his senior staff would hold down the fort, right? Wrong. They partied like it was 1999 and drove the bar straight into the ground. Customers? They vanished faster than a cold beer on a hot day. Fast forward to six months prior to John's arrival. Ami makes his grand return, fires the old crew, and brings in fresh faces. But that is not enough to fix the situation in Zanzibar. So Ami decides to lower prices of drinks to the cheapest in town in hopes of attracting more paying customers. Unfortunately, all it did was attract a crowd of old timers, a bunch of local degenerates on the hunt for cheap booze. This is the only buy I go to in Denver. Despite that, Ami's attempts to attract more customers are not working. In addition to that, the bar has an odd theme. It has a misspelled African name, owned by an Israeli guy, staffed by European bartenders, and features a giant American Statue of Liberty inside. What a weird combination. Plain and simple, the bar was bleeding money, and the clock was ticking. Enter John Taffer, the bar's last hope, flanked by Smirnoff master bartender Jenny Costa and expert chef Brian Duffy. John's recon team? Two college kids, Nick and Cameo, a couple who quickly realize that service at Zanzibar is as rare as a unicorn. One of the local drunks, drawn by the $2 beers, starts rambling on to Nick about a bunch of nonsense. Then he starts flirting with Cameo right in front of Nick. It seems like the cheap drink policy is attracting in the wrong crowd and repelling the type of customers they would want to have as a result. But wait, there's more. The staff is practically giving away the bar's profits by overpouring. Ami, not to be outdone, is handing out free drinks like their candy on Halloween. John speaks with Ami and the staff. However, all he gets from Ami is excuse after excuse. At one point, Taffer shows a video of Ami out front of the restaurant yelling, free sex, free sex, in a desperate attempt to get business. John tells him that if he said that to his wife, he would belt him in the face. I'm desperate, and you look it. Oh, zing, what a liner from Taffer. John had his crew run the numbers on how much the bar is losing each night, and the results are not pretty. They are giving away thousands of dollars of booze per weekend. When John breaks the news to Ami about the financial black hole his staff's overpouring has created, Ami loses it. He yells at his waitresses that they need to do better. However, they rightly point out to him that he is the worst offender when it comes to giving away free drinks to customers. Now Ami is even angrier. We're talking plates flying against the wall like a scene from a Greek tragedy. After some training, the moment of truth arrives for Ami and the Zanzibar, the stress test. John's got to stop watch out, aiming for 12-minute service tickets. But alas, the staff's pouring skills are still more generous than a grandma at Christmas, and they run out of clean glasses faster than you can say last call. Also, in perhaps one of the dumbest things I've ever seen on Bar Rescue, Ami has the genius idea of adding extra oil to the hamburger patties, which just nukes the burgers in a sort of grease fire on the grill. Real smart, Ami. Chef Brian Duffy and Ami go at it, arguing over Brian's frustration with getting through to helping Ami. A shouting match between the two of them erupts. As John quips, this place is a disaster and the owner is the biggest disaster of all. John, having seen enough, pulls the plug. My biggest disappointment lies with you. You too. I thought you came here to help me. On the stress test. The fight between John and Ami continues. Ami asks John, who was in charge of the kitchen? In which John says, he and you, referring to Ami and the chef in the kitchen. Ami, not taking kindly to the criticism, lashes out at Chef Duffy, calling him Fat Boy. Mr. Fat Boy! Yeah, not the wisest choice of words when the guy is literally trying to save your livelihood. 
This really upsets Brian, who approaches Ami. Fortunately, one of the staff members gets in the middle to separate the two. He then calls Brian Fatboy again. Unbelievable. This is when John Taffer absolutely loses it. Disrespectful son of a bitch! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! After telling Ami's staff that their boss is one of the biggest, beeped out he's ever met, he storms out. What do you think the word was that Taffer called Ami? Hmm, I wonder. Before he leaves, he confesses to Brian and Jenny that they might not be able to save this bar. So, was this another episode where Taffer left without saving the bar like O-Face? If he's not apologizing, we're not going anywhere! It's definitely not looking good for Zanzibar and Ami at this point. Taffer does return the next day with an ultimatum for Ami. He apologized to Brian. And what happens next? Ami actually apologizes to Brian, even shaking his hand. Ami still seems angry at John, but it doesn't faze Taffer. And he replies with, Ami, we're both fighting for the same thing. John and Ami sit down for a man-to-man -man talk, one-on-one. -on -one. Taffer says he wants to help Ami achieve the American dream, which is what Ami admired when he came to America. Ami is surprised at how much John actually cares for him, and I think this is what makes the difference. Chef Brian Duffy unveils a game-changing 10-minute express menu during the grand relaunch, aiming to speed up service without sacrificing quality. Jenny Costa, not to be outdone, introduces six tantalizing new drinks that promise to keep the customers coming back for more. But the real showstopper, that's the bar's revamped interior. When the staff walks in for the relaunch night, their jaws hit the floor. The place looks like it got a makeover from the gods of the interior design. And let's talk about the name change. Say goodbye to Zanzibar and hello to Solids and Stripes. A nod to the bar's billiards focus. Ami is over the moon with the new concept, and you can see the relief wash over him like a well-poured cocktail. The team is hustling like never before, and the vibe is electric. As the night winds down, John and Ami share a handshake and a hug that's more than a polite gesture. It's a symbol of a battle fought and a business saved. At the end of the episode, it is revealed that after John left, sales went up a whopping 50%. And more specifically, they're getting a nice crowd, as Ami puts it. The pool hall, which John convinced Ami to charge for rather than giving away for free, is now making $1,000. So whatever happened to Solid and Stripes and Ami Benari after being on Bar Rescue? The bar was featured on a subsequent follow-up Back to the Bar update episode. And it looks like things are going well for Ami. He seems to develop a little bit of humility and humbleness, allowing the staff to take charge. However, Ami decided Taffer's changes were not quite complete. He expanded just pool to add an entire game section, with shuffleboard, foosball, air hockey, and a half dozen arcade games. Despite earning $1,000 for charging for pool, Ami decided to bring back free pool, at least during the week, rather than charging for it. But the biggest change overall was that he went back to the original name. Ami reverted it back to Zanzibar, or Zanzibar as he spells it. Are you freaking kidding me? Looks like Taffer wasn't too pleased with that one. In 2017, Chef Brian Duffy even stopped in to say hi. Here he is pictured with Sarah, one of the bartenders from the episode. Although on a Twitter post, he says that when he visited the bar again, Ami wouldn't even come greet him when he got to the bar. Hmm. Sarah looks to be doing well from her Facebook profile. But the biggest question of all, what happened to Ami after the show? In an interview with a local newspaper one year after the show aired, Ami said the biggest advice he took from the show was to trust your staff, he said. You don't need to run everything yourself, you can delegate. And that was a very important question. Yes, I do delegate. I mean, I'm still in charge, but I listen more. It seems like Ami learned his lesson when it comes to trusting his staff, rather than trying to micromanage everything. With newfound success from Zanzibar, he decided to open another billiards hall, called Hangar 101 Billiards, Bowling, Bar, and Grill in Lakewood, Colorado. It has a 4.0 rating on Google. Well, there you have it, folks. The moments when Bar Rescue went from a business turnaround show to an all-out wrestling match. As we've seen, emotions and alcohol can be a volatile mix, but it's all in a day's work for John Taffer and his team. Cheers to the chaos that keeps us tuning in.